Aloha! Hey, what's up everyone? Thanks for joining me. I'm Jay Dreamers, and today we're doing uh, Topic Thursday. So I put out a video yesterday. Let me change these screens around because I'm looking at the wrong side here. I put out a video yesterday. Uh, I took a few days to work on it, trying to just condense a lot of information about uh, the lands beyond the North Wind, Hyperborea, the North Pole, uh, Mount Maru, so many other topics that touch back on ancient legends and myths and even what used to be considered accepted factual history, um, specifically regarding the land that's at the North Pole or that's alleged to be at the North Pole. Now, uh, I'm really interested in it. I'm just going to say, like, I love the idea. This, this rock right here in the middle, I call that the plasma volcano. Um, as you can see, okay, let's start from the beginning. This is actually a picture of an old map. Let me, let me pop out the chat real quick. I want to make sure everybody can hear me and stuff. You guys hear me okay? Just want to make sure there's no technical difficulty so we can jump right in. <laughs> hey, Miguel Garcia is watching in Germany at 3 o'clock in the morning. So it's, it's good to stay awake with you, Miguel. Trash Panda, Mother Dragon. Hey, what's up, everybody? All right, cool. So if the, if the audio is good... Uh, give me a thumbs up in the chat and we'll just push on forward. <clears throat> Somebody also mentioned White Fox is in the chat and says King Arthur took over the North Pole. Actually, I've come across that as well in my studies. And I just watched this movie called The Green Knight, right? I, I was going to do a video about it, but man, that's going to take a long time to do. Uh, it's a very slow going movie, but there's a lot of really good symbolism in it. And uh, King Arthur and the Arthurian legends definitely come into play whenever one starts jumping into that rabbit hole, literally sometimes, of the North Pole. Uh, so, yeah, well, I want to talk about it. This this is from a map um, that I believe Mercator drew a while back, hundreds of years ago. And this section of the map right here uh, actually used to be shown on various other maps at the time, ancient, ma ancient maps. They had uh, these four lands at the North Pole with four rivers that came uh, that sort of separated the four lands. It's also mentioned in the Bible and other religious artifacts and books and stuff. So let's do this. I'm going to turn on some screen sharing and I want to show you guys some really interesting articles. We're going to talk about Mount Maru, Rupus Negra, uh, Rupus Negra, the Inventio Fortunata, which is an interesting manuscript. We're going to take a closer look at the North Pole and the lands therein. We're also going to check out something called the Bird of Hermes, which I think you guys will be really interested in, as well as the Ripley Scroll. I just came across the Ripley Scroll as well. It's pretty interesting. We're going to talk about Japanese legends and how Japanese legend indicates that Japan was once at the center of the world. We're going to read over that. We're also going to move over towards uh, the California area and the west coast of the United States and talk about the Chumash or the Chumash people, uh, the natives who have some really interesting cave drawings over in the California area. We'll wrap it up with the Caduceus and an interesting story that takes us right back to King Arthur and how it relates to Moses in the Bible. So stick around. We're going to jump right into it. I'm going to try to stay engaged in the chat, but we're going to push on forward. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen so you can see what I'm looking at. Booyah. Mount Maru. Okay, so let's talk about Mount Maru. We'll go ahead and we're at Wikipedia right now, but a lot of the sources say the same things here, so this will suffice. Now, it says Mount Maru, also recognized as Sumeru, Sineru, or Mahamaru is the sacred five-peaked mountain of Hindu, Jain, and Buddhist cosmology. And it's considered to be the center of all physical, metaphysical, and spiritual universes. So essentially, this is the mountain that has been alleged to be right in the middle of our world, which traditionally is the North Pole. It says, many famous Buddhist temples, and similarly Jain as well as Hindu temples, uh, have been built as symbolic representations of this mountain. So these cultures, whenever they, whenever they moved about from the middle of the world and went further and further and explored and went further and further out from the middle, they took with them their legends of the gods and creation, their creation stories, their destruction stories, their prophecies for the beginning and the end. And they also took with them the stories of their holy mountain or the mountain of light or the mountain of God or all these different words for their holy mountain, right? 
Now, it says the Sumeru throne style base is a common feature of Chinese pagodas as well. So they're they're hinting that Chinese pagodas might actually be giving homage to Mount Meru. The highest point, the final bud, um, is a Burmese-style multi-tiered roof, which represents Mount Meru. Interesting. Check that out. See that? They built the buildings to look like that to pay homage to this mountain. Which also, I, I have a theory that Mount Meru is also um, the Tower of Babel. Because I, I find that there's a lot of Tower of Babel descriptions. Anytime I start looking up these these images, like artist conception and stuff based on ancient texts or whatever, it almost always looks kind of like a volcano as well. So I'm kind of wondering about that. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, so let's see what else they say here. Etymologically, the proper name of the mountain is Meru or Pali Meru, to which is added... Uh, a suffix su, which results in the meaning excellent meru or wonderful maru. Maru is also the name of the central bead in Mala. So I believe I have a different interpretation, etymologically speaking. Etymology is the study of roots of words. So word origins, essentially. We get down to the roots of those words. Mer typically indicates something from the ocean, something from the great waters. Sometimes it's a large lake. Usually it's the ocean of some kind. Uh, just like there's a lot of mer names that indicate creatures or beings from or around the waters, like merman and merwoman and uh, merlin, actually. Merlin. All right. So meru for me indicates it is a mountain that is from the waters. It's a water mountain. It's a water island. It's a water. It's surrounded by water, essentially. All right. So that's Mount Meru, and it's right smack in the middle of the world. Now, I've, I've shown you guys like Mount Meru on maps, just like this one here, right? You can pull this map up. It says this is a, this is a this is a zoom in right underneath me down here. And it says it's a detail from Mercator's map of the Arctic. This is from the 1620s. Now, once you get to about the 1700s, Mysteriously, the lands at the North Pole are just wiped off all of the maps, as is Tartaria and some other regions that it seems like they just didn't want to keep recorded for history, right? Which makes me raise an eyebrow and say, hey, why? What happened? What's going on there? Let's talk about that. Bring those back. I want to I want to be a part of this, <laughs> you know, so I like to look into these things. Um, and it says... This shows Rupus Nigra at the North Pole, surrounded by four large islands. Now, if this place is still there, um, it may be that it's just we keep, you know, the, 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 populace, the population, we keep them at bay, literally. We keep them at bay. We keep them far enough away so that the line of sight to the island is it's unseen. It's disappeared. It also may be that there is a constant storm around this island. Legend says that around this island, uh, Rupus Nigra, which we're going to learn about right now, there's actually um, a current, a water current, as well as an electric current, I would assume. Uh, but the water follows suit with the electrical current, right? And essentially, there is uh, the water around these four islands in the middle is constantly swirling. It's also alleged to be fresh water. So I, I imagine that fresh water comes out gets further away from the heat source because it's also said to be warmer towards the North Pole. Once you get beyond the north winds, then it starts to get warm again. So it's interesting to me. Let's check it out, what, what it says here. The Rupas Nigra, or Black Rock. Now, I broke that word down. Technically, when you really get down to the root, it's not rock. It's more like a steep cliff. Or So this literally means a black or dark steep cliff. A phantom island. Isn't that interesting? I also come across this concept in a lot of my studies that there is when trying to find some sort of an escape from the surface world that we live in. There's always some sort of a phantom island, an invisible island. Usually there's some sort of uh, giants that live there or superhero type beings that live there. Somebody other than just regular people, right? We're going to talk about um, a, cu a couple of portions of this, but I want to read some of this to you. So it says the Rupus Nigra. Hey, Shanna. Welcome, Shanna. Welcome to the Good Vibe Tribe. 
Rupus Nigra, or Black Rock, a phantom island, is believed to be a 33-mile wide. Actually, I, I just want to correct them. I don't know if it's 33 miles wide, but it's definitely alleged to be 33 miles in circumference. So I'm not sure if that equates to the same thing, but... Mercator actually describes the rock's circumference, circumference as 33 French miles. Uh, located at the magnetic North Pole or at the North Pole itself. Now let's back up. 33 French miles. I mentioned this in the other video and everyone, and not everyone, a few, a small handful of people are like, oh, you said 33. Oh, it's all, it's all the devil now. Stop. Just stop. Don't do that. Let's not be that person. Oh, it's the devil. You said 33. Oh, you, you, you. Something added up to the number six. That's the devil. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, my God. Put a jump, put a bungee cord on before you jump into the rabbit hole. Please do yourself a favor. You know, otherwise, you'll just be lost. Okay. Um, it may be that the number 33 coincides with this mountain and references back to this mountain. It's possible. There's also a 33rd degree parallel, which is alleged to be a quote unquote safe zone. I don't know. Possibly. Uh, but it's very interesting. Let's read on. It purportedly, purportedly explains why all compasses point to this direction. Why is that? Because it's a magnetic rock. It's a magnetic mountain. The idea comes from a lost work titled Inventio Fortunata. Interesting. Inventio Fortunata or a fortunate discovery, essentially is what it means, or a valuable discovery, is a lost book probably dating from the 14th century containing a description of the North Pole as a magnetic island surrounded by a giant whirlpool, whirlpool and four continents or four islands. No direct extracts, blah, blah. I'm not going to read the rest of that. All right. We'll, we'll actually come right back to that. All right. So basically there's this book, this lost book, okay, that is referenced by many different people who are of note historically speaking, they reference this lost book. Kind of like in the Bible, if, if you're one that studies like, you know, the Bible and I'm, I'm sure other holy scriptures of ancient times also do this, but the Bible references books that are not known. People don't know where to find these books. It says, is it not, you know, for more information, is it not written in the book of, you know, Bob the 13th or whatever. I just made that up. But you know what I mean? Like it says that these are lost books, books that no one has a copy of, but they are known to have existed and have and are known to have some sort of importance because they're referenced so often and so much. David, hey, welcome to the Good Vibe Tribe, David. All right. So Rupas Negra, let's read on just a bit more. I want to I want to show you guys something else, too. Uh, so it was mentioned in this book and it says the island features is featured on maps from the 16th and the 17th centuries, including those of Gerardus Merc uh, Mercador or Mercator. Uh, he was a prolific and well-known and well-established studier, explorer. Uh, okay, I don't know if he was an explorer, but I assume he's an explorer if he's a map maker. So take back explorer. Might not be true. I don't know. Um, but he was well known, okay? He wasn't a tinfoil hat wearing weirdo that people just dismissed, you know what I mean? And they dismissed a lot of people back then, okay? From the 16th century, if you had some wacko weird ideas that were not accepted by the church or the government or mainstream population, not like times have changed, but yeah, they would burn you at the stake. They'd kill you, you know? You'd be arrested at the very least and spend a very long time behind bars. They paid people like this guy, to go out on expeditions and to give their valuable input as to these locations and stuff that may hold items or places of significance or value. So, I, you know, take that with a grain of salt. So, uh, let's see. So, Mer Mercator uh, featured this on his maps and his successors did too. Some of them. Uh, Mercator describes the island in a 1577 letter to John D. Who's John Dee? Let's check it out. John Dee was an English mathematician, astronomer, astrologer, teacher, occultist, and alchemist. Now, in today's world, pff, I mean, that 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 might not fly, you know, if, if this guy is the right-hand man for the president of the United States or something. But in today's world, we have different terminology for pretty much everything they just listed. We just slap different labels on it so that it's okay, right? Uh, believe me, the president and kings and queens, and they, they all have their cosmologists and their astrologers and all that stuff as well, personal ones that serve them. 
All right, so anyways, John D. Uh, John D, he was all these things. Angel Wings, welcome to the Good Vibe Tribe. Good to have you. John D was all of these things. He was the court astronomer for and advisor to Elizabeth I and spent much of his time on alchemy, divination, and hermetic philosophy. Interesting. We'll come back to Hermes here in a bit. But he writes in a letter, okay? This is quoted a lot. In the midst of the four countries is a whirlpool into which there empty these four indrawing seas which divide the north. And the water rushes round and descends into the earth, just as if it were one pouring, uh, just as just as if one were pouring it through a filter funnel. So what he's saying is there's a whirlpool. The water's up there. The current will just take a boat whoosh, off in whatever direction the current's going in. It's four degrees wide on every side of the pole. That is to say, eight degrees altogether, except the right under the pole. Except that, right under the pole, there lies a bare rock in the midst of the sea. Its circumference is almost 33 French miles, and it's all of magnetic stone. Interesting, right? Now, this particular note is in a museum. It's just sitting in a museum somewhere. That's how important this actual passage was, that it's sitting in a museum, I believe, in, uh, in the UK somewhere. Uh, let's see here. So we're going to skip the, re the rest of this part. So that's Rupus Negra. I feel like we've got a good basic understanding of it. Now let's check out this book that it's mentioned in, Invincio Fortunata. And then we're going to check out some cool images too. Invincio Fortunata, fortunate or fortune making discovery, valuable discovery, however you'd like to interpret that, is a lost book, probably dating from the 14th century, containing the description of the North Pole as a magnetic island. Now, let me tell you something else. I also ran across in my research that there were some letters sent from some from some explorers back to royalty saying, hey, sorry, I was looking for the uh, Invincio Fortunata book, couldn't find it, but here's what I did find. People were actively asking for this book, seeing if they could acquire it and find it. Uh, let's see. So it says that the North Pole is a magnetic island, the Rupas Negra, surrounded by a giant whirlpool and four continents. No direct extracts from the document have been discovered, but its influence on the Western idea of the geography of the Arctic region persisted for several centuries. Now, keep in mind, it's not like there's just one group of people like the Spanish or the English or whoever that has ventured far enough out into the Arctic to discover these islands. They're, there's If you start looking into the North Pole and the lands at the North Pole, you'll come across reference after reference across the world in different cultures that all talk, you know, I mean, I don't know about every single one of them. Okay, I try to stay from the absolutes, but many. Okay, I've come across enough from such dispersed regions in the world that I could say that there's something to this. That's what I'm saying. Uh, let's see here. I've already read through this. Was there anything of note? Uh, Greenland, interesting. Greenland also comes into play when I start looking for these discoveries. I also look to see if I could book a flight to the North Pole. No, apparently. Um, and there's a lot of debate as to whether or not people can fly over the North Pole or go to the North Pole because obviously we have planes, right? Why don't we just fly over to the North Pole? Why don't we just go check it out? Well, I guess, you know, there's various factors that come into play and the planes have to divert their route. Apparently there are these winds around the North Pole that spin in a certain direction. Hey, Chris, thanks for the donation. Chris says, good work. Keep it up. God bless you and yours. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate you. Uh, but there's these circular winds, the Arctic winds or whatever. So what they do is they try to like ride these winds on the outskirts so that they can like get there faster. I don't know. I just it sounds real fishy to me. There's a lot of questions that I have about it. So I'm I'm not super convinced that these lands are not there. Okay. If anything, I'm leaning towards they are. Or I mean, regardless, I feel like they are. Okay. If they are not visible, there's a couple of ways that that could happen. One, it could just be underwater. Maybe the flooding covered all of those particular areas and the magnetic mountain or volcano could still have an area of water around it because a strong magnet actually repels water. So it's possible that it's still there, even if it is underwater, but I'm not so sure it's underwater, but it could be. Now, this is on maps, just like this one. There's a few of these like this. You can Google many of them. I would like to show you a globe. You want to see a globe that actually has this? 
All right, we'll go back to like the first, the oldest globe that we have. Let me go ahead and show you a little video here. If I can find it, where did I put that thing? Oh, video, boom. Papow. Oh, no. that didn't work. Papow, there it is. All right, sweet. All right, so here is a 3D. Somebody took the actual uh, globe, okay, because I didn't want to just show you pictures of it and, you know, all the videos I saw weren't, weren't great. Somebody did a really awesome 3D representation. Uh, and then this right here is just it tilting so you can see the North Pole right there on this globe that was made in, you know, 14, 1500, somewhere around there. But as you can see, there's clearly land that goes in a circle that it looks like there's the four rivers jetting out from each side. Now on this one, there happens to be a hole. It's the right place for one to be, if you ask me. But also you have to keep in mind this was a globe and it was mounted on the top and the bottom. So there's also a hole in the bottom of it as well. So I just want to show you that. I thought that was something of particular interest to me. Uh, and you can also find this online too if you google it just type in like oldest globe and it'll pop up this is the oldest one that we that that's known to man okay all right so sweet we'll go ahead and get rid of that video real quick and truck on to some other stuff here booyah check that out anything going on in the chat let me double check hey did you go did you guys like that i, I got a lot of overwhelming positive feedback and the views on that last video about the all-seeing eye and the plasma volcano and the hole in the sky or the wheel in the sky man that really inspired me i might have to start doing more videos like that in the future so thanks for your feedback all right so let's see what else we got here this is the area now i pulled this website up because i wanted to share some stuff uh this goes over mercator it's kind of boring Let's see what else we got. I like getting right to the fun stuff. Blah, blah, blah. The different sizes of the maps. Here's another example where they put the lands up there on the top. See that? Up there. Let's see what else we got. Mm. Okay, I'm going to read this particular part, okay? By the 1500s, not very many people had ventured up to the Arctic. Really? Time out. Where'd that come from? How's that a fact? By the 1500s, not, not very many people had ventured up to the Arctic. I've come across the exact opposite. I would say many people like had ventured up to the Arctic. Maybe not the majority of the Earth's population or anything, but I've come across all kinds of um, writings and notes from explorers and stories from people who are just travelers and fishermen and all kinds of different stories of various many people who have been up there. So just keep in mind when you come when you're reading websites or you're watching a YouTube video, even mine, right? Just take what resonates. This that particular statement does not resonate with me. No explorer would ever set foot on the pole itself until 1909. No, disagree. Sorry, I don't know where they're getting this. Uh, this didn't stop Mercator though. Of course it didn't stop him. This dude was this dude was renowned for his cartography excellence, his map making skills. Of course it didn't stop him that this website thinks that not very many people, you know, made made it to the lands at the North Pole or to the North Pole or whatever. Anyways, this didn't stop Mercator who dug into some dicey sources to suss out what what he should include. Doesn't that sound garbage? That sounds so garbage to me, right? Like that didn't st uh, these facts that 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 this website accepts today didn't stop this world-renowned cartographer uh, to put out some dicey source information. You see how they word that? Ew, I don't like that. Anyways, you got to look for the truth inside of it, though. See, they are they're telling you some truth in here, even though they're throwing a lot of their personal opinion in there as well. Doesn't mean it's all bad. You can still get some good out of stuff. The most influential, called Inventio Fortunata, translation Fortunate Discoveries, was a 14th century travelogue written by an unknown source. In Mercator's words, it traced the travels of an English minor friar of Oxford who traveled to Norway and then pushed on further by magical arts. Okay, so this guy went to Norway and he kept on going. And this is the this is a trend that I've found in all these stories that people just decide they're going to keep going. They're going to push past that Arctic cold boundary. And when they do, 
What a surprise. They're in for a surprise. They're in for a treat, actually, because they find wonders untold and unheard of. This mysterious book gave Mercator the centerpiece of his map. Think about this is the centerpiece of the map. Literally kind of means, you know, the most important part. This is the thing everyone's going to look right at, right at the middle. So if he's just dicing it up from some old wives' tales and rumors from unknown who knows, right? Why in the world would he stick this right in the center for everyone to see, for kings and queens to use? You know what I mean? Like, he's risking his life to do anything that would be considered unorthodox, strange, or too, too bold. You know what I mean? Anywho, uh, let's see. Rupus Negra at the middle, the black, very high cliff. The presence of this information was widely accepted at the time. Imagine that. It was widely accepted at the time. Okay. Most people thought it was magnetic, which provided an easy explanation for why compasses point north. Well, of course that's an easy explanation. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> the giant magnetic mountain with all these stories of people who have gone to it. Um, ships that have gotten too close to it. All the metal is said to just be pulled from the ship. Like you can't wear metal and stuff like that. I don't know. I'm saying there's a lot of stories that corroborate this particular myth and legend. Okay. But it says Mercator was not quite convinced by this argument and included a different rock, which he labels magnetic pole in the top left corner of the map, just north of the Strait of Anain. Now I've checked that one out too. I'm still researching it, so I'm not going to speak on it too much right now. Uh, let's see. Mercator draws the Arctic in four large chunks separated by channels of flowing water, which meet in the middle in a giant whirlpool. He got this idea from two 16th century explorers, Martin F uh, Frobish Frobisher? 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 and James Davis, who each made it as far as what is now northern Canada. Both documented their experiences, blah, 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 blah. Without cease, it care. Oh, here we go. So these guys wrote about these currents, the currents that go around this island, vicious currents, currents, which they wrote, pulled giant icebergs along like they were nothing. Start going faster and faster. You know what this reminds me of? Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Remember that when they get in that creepy boat, that, that creepy boat, and he takes them through the tunnel, and it like starts going faster and faster, and he's like, "No way to tell which way we are going," and it's all it's all creepy and stuff. That's kind of like what this is describing. Like you're in the boat, and the current just whoo, sh takes off. It you can't even use the winds or anything. You just you're following that current. You know what I mean? Uh, let's see here. They're being absorbed into the bowels of the earth. So they're saying that if you follow the current, you'll be able to get into the earth itself. This is actually pretty interesting right here. You see this? This is one of the lands off to the side over here. Sometimes it's shown unfinished. Sometimes it's finished. But it says pygmy. And there's like some ancient, what looks to be Italian or something right there. And I believe, if I remember correctly, that the translation says something like here is where the pygmies live. These are humanoid beings that are a maximum four feet tall. Um, and this goes on to say that they're, uh, I forgot what the word is, but they're basically kind of like um, what the northern people refer to as, ah, I, forgot what the, I forgot what the word for it is, but it's basically like a dwarf from the, from the Lord of the Rings. Or, or a hobbit or something. It's, it's exactly like that. They said that the pygmies there are super strong. They're very intelligent. They seem to live for a long time. They have really long noses and long ears. But they're uh, real small people. They're just real tiny people. Which is really interesting because remember Gulliver's Travels? He travels, he gets lost out on the ocean, lands on the beach of some land where there's all these real small people. He called him the they they called him the Lilliputians in that story. But then he goes again, gets lost on the ocean again, wakes up on another land. Now there's other lands here in the middle, and most of these lands are said to be inhabited by giants. This particular area is said to be inhabited by real small tiny humanoids, but there are also, on the flip side of that coin, giants said to live here and to come from here and live near here. Remember on the Princess Bride when he's like, You want me to take you back where you came from? 
to Greenland or whatever. That, and he's talking to the giant who's from Greenland or lands beyond Greenland. I think they mention Greenland a lot because it actually might connect or be the closest land to this particular area right here. All right. Uh, the home of the pygmies, right? I forgot what that word is for pygmy. Not dwarf. I mean, they're basically dwarfs. You're totally right. <laughs> All right. So let's see what else we got here. Uh, anything good? Anything good? We might skip on. Let's skip on. All right. So that's really all I wanted to show you with that website. Let's check out. We already talked about Mount Maru. We're not going to get too deep into that right now. Because, you know, that's exactly what we're talking about. I want to switch gears. Let's talk about this. This is really interesting. This is the bird of Hermes. Now, how is, the, how is Hermes even, how is any of this related, right? Well, if you watched my video on the all-seeing eye and we broke it down, we talked about how the plasma volcano erupts every other cycle, right? It shoots out this blue beam of light, stairway to heaven, whatever you want to call it, many different uh, descriptions for it. Um, really interesting too, man. It's Ah, oh, it's, it's so spot on the money with, for describing all these ancient religions and religious figures and mythical figures and legendary heroes and stuff. Oh, snap. My phone is ringing. I forgot to turn off the ringer. I hope it's not being recorded. One sec. I'm sorry to be rude. I have to like go turn off my ringer because I don't want to get a copyright strike because I have Westworld theme. One sec. Okay, sorry about that. Note to self, turn off your phone before you do a live stream. All right, back to the bird of Hermes. All right, so check this out. If you remember that video, when that plasma shoots up out of the volcano and reaches out and branches out to the sky, touches the sky, it creates so many different images. One of those, or actually a few of those, uh, in different cultures is this image of this bird with its wings spread out to the side, usually every time I've ever seen, uh, it's always looking off to like one side or the other, right? Depending on where you are in the world, it might be facing one way, or if you're on the other side of the world, it might be facing the other way, right? But regardless, it's got these wings that branch out. And uh, that's one of the ways that this light was interpreted. It could be the Thunderbird, it could be the Phoenix, it could be whatever, all kinds of different birds that are usually sp spreading out their wings in an unnatural manner, straight out to the sides. Remember, birds' wings are on their back. Okay, they're essentially like back here. So whenever they open them up, they go behind them. Okay, they don't go straight out to the side like that, which tells you it's not an actual physical bird. It's a sim it's symbolic of something else that looks like a bird, right? Anyways, here's the bird of Hermes. Hermes is interesting. Let me tell you why Hermes is interesting before we get to his bird, because here is his symbol, the caduceus. Now the caduceus, as you can see here, sort of, let me scooch that over a bit. Oh, check it out. Let me just... All right. Boom. All right. And it's right underneath me here is the caduceus. You've seen the symbol before. If you've ever seen an ambulance or been to a hospital or something, sometimes it's got one snake. Sometimes it's got two. Sometimes there's other things added or taken away from it. But in general, these are the four symbols together that compromise uh, or the comprise of um, the elements that represent this god. Um named Hermes and Mercury and some other names too. There's millions of names for this particular light in the sky or figure or whatever you want to call it, okay? Entity. I'm not saying it's not even alive, whatever. I'm just saying this represents that. That right there underneath me is the, the staff of like every god figure that's ever walked ever. Always has a staff, right? So that's the staff, the blue beam that shoots up. The dot on the top is the, the eye in the sky or the opening in the sky or the opening in the the sky above us. Uh, then you've got the wings that are spread out just like that. Boom. And then you've got these two snakes, which are obviously not s snakes, but they are plasma. They're light swirling up into the skies, into the heavens, creating like a spiral staircase or whatever you want to call it. Um, so that's what's interesting about Hermes. He carries this with him everywhere. Let me show you a picture of Hermes real quick. Can I do that? Where's Hermes? Boom. And we go to images. So, all right, so he, oh, what? Ah, lame. Hermes, Greek, God. I don't care about purses right now. Jeez. See, we name all this stuff after 
after all of this. This is this is our origins. That's why I get so excited about it because people don't understand why their bags and their products and their cars and everything is named literally after an event that created the world we live in and destroys it at the same time. Anyways, that's Hermes right there. As you can see, he's carrying his uh, his Caduceus with him wherever he goes. That's one of his main deals, as well as like the wings and stuff too. But I'm not going to get into that symbolism right now. All right, so let's go back to the bird of Hermes. You should Google this. I highly recommend it. I highly recommend checking this out because this is a very interesting read. Let's read this, and then we're going to get into the Ripley scroll next. The bird of Hermes is my name. I have devoured my wings to make me tame, for I am the one to blame for bringing forth destruction's flame. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we're just going to, I'm going to go back into it. The bird of Hermes is my name. Bringing chaos is my came. From Mount Olympus I hail, and all of the gods' grace shall fail. Nothing will remain the same. For all has been consumed by my flame, everything into ashes, oh so frail, and a world covered by my bloody veil. Hermes is my name, and my bird has become tamed. No longer from the heavens it shall hail, and forevermore the rivers of blood shall sail, it shall sail. The bird of Hermes is my name, my message has been delivered now that I am tamed. From the heavens chaos and destruction shall hail. And forevermore, this world has become my bloody hell. Deep. Okay, sounds kind of sounds kind of dark and gothic. I love it. I think it's great. Let's talk about it. Let's bring it to light. If it's dark, if it sounds gothic and dark and, and scary and creepy and the devil, that's because it's in the dark. Bring it into the light. Shine some light on it. Figure it out. Let's see what it means. Let's see, what's, let's see why it's important. The bird of Hermes is my name. I have devoured my wings to make me tame. Remember how I said that bird is always looking to one side and that and those wings, that plasma that shoots up from the middle, it spreads out in different directions. It, it creates these little currents up in the sky of plasma. Now those currents, that turbulence, it will ball up sometimes. It will branch out in different directions as it follows the currents that are naturally in the air already and the ones that are being made Right. And it, keep in mind, it'll have different uh, it'll have different transitional periods. Right. It'll have its its beginning period where it's just a pole, just a light. And then it'll grow legs and then it'll have feathers and it'll look like all kinds of stuff. Right. But they change. Some of those feathers disappear from time to time or one of the breast it's basically a breast okay one of the dots on each side of the stick figure or whatever will disappear it'll become amazonian or without a breast um some of the the feathers will disappear and reappear so that's what this poem is describing to me is this uh central figure the squatting man all these different variants that you could call it basically it's the beam of plasma that shoots up out of the sky okay uh the light of the world etc so he says, I am the one to blame for bringing forth destruction's flame. This thing is totally related to the end of the world, to some sort of an apocalyptic event, right? And related to this Titan god, Hermes. Um, and he says that he brings chaos from Mount Olympus I hail. Mount Olympus, like we already talked about, um, is another name that's that's basically the plasma volcano rupus negra at the center of the world the mountain of the gods why is it always the mountain of the gods well if you imagine that a hole opens up at the north pole directly above rupus negra and that's the only time beings can come in and the only time that we can leave with maybe some exception there's always exception right uh but in general you would expect those beings to come straight down and to land right about there in the lands in the middle of the world, right? I mean, that's what I would expect. It makes the most sense. Uh, yeah, so anyways, that's why the gods always land on a mountain. Uh, nothing will remain the same. All has been consumed by my flame. So this is also symbolism for the phoenix, okay? So a lot of you are probably picking on the phoenix symbolism here. Now, where did I get this from? I was actually studying the Ripley scroll. Let me change this so it's... Jesus. I'm so sorry that's so bright. Let's uh let's go ahead and go over it though. Man, I normally I don't like to have my screen so bright, but this is 
actually kind of important, so I'm going to check it out. The Ripley Scroll. The Ripley Scroll is an important 15th century work of emblematic symbolism. Hold on, let me make this a little smaller. Mm, that's good. Boom. All right. Uh, 15th century work of em emblematic symbolism. 21 copies are known. So this book was popular enough, valuable enough, important enough for them to make 21 copies of it in a time whenever they didn't, I don't believe they were, you know, using the printing press if they even had it at the time. So they were hand copied. 21 copies are known, dating from the early 16th century to the mid-17th. There are two different forms of the symbolism with 17 manuscripts of the main version. Okay, so I'm just going to sum up what he's saying. He's saying that he's using one of the versions. That's all he's saying. He's saying, I'm just using one of these versions. Let's check it out. Chapter 1. It's not very long. You must make water of the earth and earth of the air, air of the fire and fire of the earth, the black sea, the black luna, the black soul. What is he talking about? There's even these alchemical images that they show here. Now, these are fun for me. I love to figure out these old um, alchemical drawings that they come up with and stuff because I understand that they're not literal. Usually, okay? Sometimes some images are literal, but you have to figure out the context. What you're looking at right now is one of these old drawings. Some people who are not very learned in the esoteric would just dismiss this as just, I don't know what that is. That looks like the devil. That looks like it's evil, whatever it may be. Mm, let's sh shed some light on it so that you understand better what it's talking about. I'm actually not going to break the images down. I just want to read it. Here is the last of the white stone and the beginning of the red. Now check this out. Of the sun take the light, the red gum that is so bright, and of the moon do also the which gum they both trow. The philosopher's sulfur vive, this I call it without strife. Kybrite and Kybrite it is called also, and other names, many more of them draw out a tincture and make of them a marriage pure between husband and wife. Okay, this is a little hard to understand. I, I get that. So basically, he's talking about and referencing right now something called an alchemical wedding. Okay, it is what I call the cosmic union. It's the sky and the earth. It's referencing the apocalypse. Now, remember, we live in a fractal verse. So this can be true on many different levels about many different things. But I'm looking at the grand scale of our world, which for me is the most important right now in my life. All right. So the red gum that is so bright. What is gum? I just want to stop right there. They didn't, I don't believe they had chewing gum and like Wrigley's and stuff like that back in this time. So when they're talking about gum, they're talking about something that is of plastic or plasticity, right? Something that is plasmic or malleable or something like that, like plasma is named after essentially. Uh, let's see here. What else we got? Uh, let's see. Where was I? And other names, many more. Of them draw a tincture, and make of them marriage pure between husband and wife, espoused with the water of life, but of this water thou must beware, or else thy work will be full bare. He must be made of his own kind, mark thou now in thy mind. Acetome of philosophers men call this a water's abiding, so it is. The maiden's, the maiden's milk of the dew, that all the work doth renew. Okay, time out. I want to stop about. I want to stop real quick because it's mentioning the dew. I know some of this is like. Don't worry if some of this goes over your head. I'm just gonna call out little important things that pop out to me. But specifically when it talks about the dew, right? Uh, the maiden's milk of the dew. So we talked about the dew and how the Israelites, uh, you know, ventured out in the wilderness or whatnot, and they had to live off of this dew that hardened and became a sort of wafer or cracker, manna, whatever you want to call it. And then there's also this sort of dew that uh, was highly sought after to be collected by the knights and um, various n nobility and stuff. They're looking for this residue that's left over by these sacred bees. They're looking for the sacred honey from the sacred bees. Could that be related to the sacred dew? Could that be related possibly to the blood of Christ or other things? I think it's possible. Let's see what else it says. The serpent of life, it is called also. 
and other names many more, that which causeth generation betwixt the man and the woman. But look thou no division, be there in conjunction of the moon and sun. All right, I can't really read this. I feel like I'm going to lose a lot of people if I keep reading this. So I recommend this. It's an excellent study. Interesting pictures. See the little tree, the little column shooting up right through the middle there, and then it spreads out. And there's like the four corners for the pyramid or whatever in the middle. Uh, then it says the red loon, which is the red moon, the blood moon, if you want to call it that. The spirit of water, red soul, the red sun, and the red sea. And then it goes on about this as well. I'm just going to leave this for you guys to read. I'm not going to read it all right now because I feel like it would deserve better than just me reading it. Okay. So I'm going to leave this for you. Oh, this is so interesting. There's so much good stuff here though. Look, here is the last of the red and the beginning to put away the dead. The elixir vitae, which means the elixir of life, the fountain of youth. This is very interesting. So check this out. It's called the Ripley scroll. Oh, and this is the part in the scroll where I found this out because I was researching all of this, right? And this is where it says, The bird of Hermes is my name, eating my wings to make me tame. The red sea, the red soul, red elixir of life, the red stone, the white stone, elixir vitae, luna in the crescent. And then you've got some interesting pictures here that we've already kind of covered in the all-seeing eye video, if you pay attention. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip... Kibrick, check that out. Kibrick forsooth is my brother. Kibrick sounds like Kubrick, like Stanley Kubrick. That's interesting. All right, I can't stay on this for too long. I'll get caught up in this and talk about this for another hour. I'm going to leave this for another time and allow you guys to check it out on your own if you'd like to. Let's switch gears and talk about Japan. Hold on, let me just double check in the chat. I've, I've not been looking at the chat for a minute. Everything's good. All right, no mentions. All right, sweet. Let's, let's trek on. Now, check this out. Let's bring it up a bit. This is from a, a website called sacredtexts.com. I do like to read sacred texts. I do like to study them. I do love to compare all the different stories, find all of what's similar, and make up something myself. Make up something that makes more sense than each individual one by putting them together. Chapter 2, The Cradle of the race in ancient Japanese thought. Let's check this out. According to the earliest cosmology of the Japanese, as given in their most ancient book, the Kojiki. That's interesting, Koji. The Kojiki, the creators and the first inhabitants of our world, were a god and goddess. Izanagi. Ooh, Izanagi. Nagi. Na the Nagi. Remember that? Serpent, Nagi, flame, plasma, serpent, Nagi. I also know that there's the, 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 the race that are called the Nagi, but hey, maybe that's because they're associated with the plasma, right? Or the dragons or whatever you would like to call them. I'm like, I'm, I'm falling down on my chair. Hold on. Sorry. I have a pillow in this chair. There we go. And then I sit on my leg too. <laughs> I was like, it's like getting lower and lower and lower. I'm like, what's going on here? I'm slipping off my chair. All right, back to our study here. Let's go ahead and make this a tad bigger. According to the earliest cosmology of the Japanese, as given in their most ancient book, the Kojiki, the creators and first inhabitants of our world were a god and goddess, Izanagi and Izanani by name. These in the beginning, we quote from Sir Edward Reed, Standing on the bridge of heaven, pushed down a spear into the green plain of the sea, stirred it around and around. When they drew it up, the drops which fell from its end consolidated and became an island. The sunborn pair descended onto the island and planting a spear in the ground, pointing downwards, built a place around it, taking that for the central roof pillar, the pillar of the roof. Uh, the spear became the axis of the earth, which had been caused to revolve by the stirring around. So let me, let's break, let's read that real quick one more time. I feel like that deserves a second look. Okay. So I'm going to skip all the beginning stuff. Let's get right to the story. It says that there were these two gods standing on the bridge of heaven. That's the by, that's the Bifrost bridge. Right? There's always some sort of a bridge to get from um, 
a certain point at the North Pole to the actual middle, okay? Or from the North Pole, from that plasma volcano, from the very edge, outward, up to the actual heavens, because there is a beam of light that goes up towards the heavens, right? Uh, let's see. Let's read on. So they're on they're on the bridge. They push down a spear into the green plain of the sea. So remember, this is saying that they're in the middle of the earth. They push down a spear. Now, sometimes this beam is referred to as a spear, a staff, a staros, a beam, a stake, um, all these different, a sword. This is literally the sword in the stone. Okay? You know, like, we're talking about, um, oh, hey, 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 Mikey. Mikey says, oh, Mikey just joined the Good Vibe Tribe. Welcome, Mikey. Uh, but I, this is really important as far as getting into the staff. This is going to take us right into the staff of Moses. So I'm going to talk about that next. So they pushed a, a spear down into the earth, essentially, or into the waters, which were in the middle, stirred it around and around, and uh, there was drops that fell off the spear, which turned into an island. That is the mysterious island. That's the island at the middle of the world in the North Pole. Now, obviously, if we look at a map, Japan's not in the middle of the world, but maybe they take their creation story and took it from wherever they came from as they migrated to what is now called Japan and said, hey, Jap yeah, we, we descend from our ancestors, you know, knew that Japan, the place where we lived or our ancestors lived, okay, Japan, um, wherever, pretty much every country takes claim that theirs is the original or, or, or whatever. Uh, I digress. Let's keep reading. So they put the spear into the ground. Uh, let's see. They built a palace around it, taking that for the central roof pillar. So this was a pillar, a central pillar to the roof of the world. The Japanese are saying that this was the spear held up the world, just like Atlas was charged to hold up the world, right? Or how about Prometheus, who was tied to a very large rock, Right? He brought the fire or the light down from the heavens and he was he was basically cursed to be tied to the side of like a volcano or a very large rock or whatever. And he was going to get his liver pecked at by some bird forever. Right, There's the bird up in the sky. Prometheus is the big squatting stick man. Anyway, all right, let's, let's see what else we got. This island, however, there's always this mysterious island, right? Islands, this is why islands intrigue us on like a, sub, a deep collective subconscious level, I believe. This island, however, was the Japanese Eden. I would say this island was every Eden. Is <laughs> If I'm going to reach a little bit further. Hey, hey, hey. LML, L, or LMLHL just joined the Good Vibe Tribe too. What's up, everybody? Hey, welcome to the group. Welcome to the Good Vibe Tribe. All right, so let's read on. Now, this is interesting. This island, however, was the Japanese Eden. Here originated the human race. Its name was Ono Gorijima. Deluxe Books. What's up, Fortnite channel? I love Fortnite. Oh my god, I could talk to you all day long about symbolism in Fortnite. Jesus. Um, okay, so the name of this island was Ono Gorijima. Now, isn't that interesting? Because Gorija, Goriji sounds kind of like Godzilla in its original form, which is kind of like Gorilla. Uh, the Island of the Congealed Drop. Tawa, thanks a lot, Tawa. I appreciate you. Uh, this was the axis of the Earth. The axis is the middle of the Earth. Over it was the pivot of the Vault of Heaven. Mr. Reed, who has no theory on the subject to maintain, I would love to talk to Mr. Reed, right, says the island must have been situated at the pole of the Earth. He's talking about Japan. So in, in their mind, instead of just saying that the Japanese brought this story of, of where they came from, they're saying that the whole earth with the ball theory and, and stuff like that, right, was shifted and now Japan was at the middle and now Japan is the four islands and now Japan has its black mountain and all that stuff. I'm not so sure about that. I'm, I'm not going to go with that one. It's fine if, if you guys like that theory. It's not my favorite, though, so I'm not going to talk about it a lot. Uh, the island must have been situated at the North Pole, basically, in like manner, with no idea of the vast anthropological significance and value of the datum, Mr. Griffiths remarks, the island formed by the congealed drops was once at the North Pole. 
but has since been taken to its present position in the Inland Sea. Japan, essentially. Okay. So, interesting. Interesting. There's always a little truth in there, right? Anything else? Uh, let's see. That's interesting, too. Okay. So, now, let's go from the spear, the world spear of Japanese lore and legend and history, okay? And let's compare that to this really interesting story that I love to talk about from the Book of Joshua. The Book of Joshua is a contemporary of the, the Book of Genesis in the Bible, the creation event story, also Jubilees, also a, a few other books that recount the beginnings of life here in our world, okay? Now, I'm just going to sum up a couple of things. I got to catch you guys up real quick. First of all, the biblical story of Moses does not talk about much of Moses's actual life, okay? If you look in the book of Genesis, it's it basically the Moses story. He gets a quick mention when he's like a kid, and then boom, he's 80 years old, and that's when the story picks up. That's why he's in the movie. He's like old 80-year-old Moses or whatever. And let me tell you this. In the book of Joshua, if you'd like a book that fills in a lot of the gaps that the, um, the book of Genesis leaves out, highly, highly recommend checking out the book of Joshua, as well as Jubilees, as well as Enoch, also very good. But Joshua, in my opinion, blows him out of the water. It's a great book. So uh, in Joshua, little did we know, Moses, actually, when he left Egypt, he went down into lower Africa, into the land of Cush, or Cush, and he became the leader of the Cushites for years and years. He brought the Cushites to prosperity. He helped them to uh, defeat their enemies and stuff, and the king had died, so the Cushites essentially made him an honorary king or leader of their country until the true heir to the throne was old enough in which case they said, hey, Moses, we love you and, and everything, but you're not really a Cushite. And we have a Cushite prince that can become the king. So how about you take all your riches and just go somewhere else? Okay, is essentially what happened. Moses was like, that's cool and that's fair. I appreciate it all the time. Thanks for all the riches. I'm going to go to this other land. So he goes to this place affectionately known as Midian. All right. So he ventures out and I'm going to give you the short version. In the movies, when Moses gets to Midian, he like starts kicking butt and protecting all these little princess chicks from some sheik or whatever, right? And he's got a staff, and that's where he gets his staff. Now, that part is true. However, they leave out the part where Moses was immediately re arrested and put into a dungeon for like 10 years. And the reason that he likes the girl that he, he meets, I think it was Zipporah, the reason he likes her so much is because she actually comes down and feeds him every day for like 10 years. Um, he wasn't supposed to be fed, and the guy who was in charge of the jail thought he was just dead, basically, until he sees him 10 years later. So that's where this story picks up. Moses is in Midian. He had been gone from the land of Cush for about 10 years or so. He was in a jail for a very long time. And then, check this out. I'm going to read this. Let me, let me make it a little smaller. Where is it? Man, I make it way smaller. Why is it so... Hold on, let me fix this here. Booyah. And then we make it bigger. I'm going to fix this. I want you guys to be able to read along with me here because I know not everyone has access to the book of Joshua. Okay, that's good. That's good. All right, I'm just going to read it. Here we go. All right, now, I also want to tell you this. I want to ask you guys to pay attention to something, okay? As I read this story about Moses finding his staff, Please keep in mind the very well-known story of King Arthur and his famous sword, Excalibur. All right, here we go. Uh, if you want to know where to find this, by the way, you can look it up. It is the book of Joshua, chapter 77. There's a lot of chapters in Joshua, by the way. All right, verse 38. And afterward, Moses went into the garden. There's the garden. Okay, when you hear garden... Think about those four, those four islands in the North Pole, okay? Because it's essentially known to be a garden. All right. Afterward, Moses went into the garden of Reguel, uh, Reguel, which was behind the house. And he there prayed to the Lord his God, who had done mighty wonders for him. Hold on. Let me get rid of that. 
And it was while he prayed, he looked opposite to him and behold, a sapphire stick that was placed into the ground. Sapphire is blue. Just keep that in mind. Sapphire stick placed into the ground, which was planted in the midst of the garden. And he approached the stick and he looked and behold, the name of the Lord of hosts was engraved thereon, written and developed upon the stick. And he read it and stretched forth his hand and he plucked it like a forest tree from the thicket and the stick was in his hand. And this is the stick which all of the works of our God were performed after he had created heaven and earth and all of the hosts of them, seas, rivers, and all of the fishes. This, is, this stick had something to do with the creation of these things. And when God had driven Adam from the Garden of Eden, he took the stick in his hand and went and tilled the ground from which he was taken. And the stick came down to Noah and was given to Shem and his descendants until it came into the hands of Abraham the Hebrew. This is where it gets really interesting. And when Abraham had given all that he had to his son Isaac, or Isaac, he also gave him this stick. And when Jacob had fled to Padan Aram, he took it into his hand. And when he returned to his father, uh, he had not left it behind him. Also, when he went down into Egypt, he took it into his hand and he gave it to Joseph, the one, uh, one portion above his brethren, for Jacob had taken it by force from his brother Esau. So there's a whole backstory to all this, okay? So I can't go over that. It's way too in, de in, in depth, so we'll just keep reading. Thank you. And after the death of Joseph, the nobles of Egypt came into the house of Joseph uh, Joseph. And the stick came into the hand of Rechuel, the Midianite. And when he went out of Egypt, he took it in his hand and planted it in his garden. Now check this out. And all of the mighty men of the Kenites tried to pluck it when they endeavored to get Zipporah, his daughter. But they were all unsuccessful. So the stick remained planted in the garden of Rechuel until he came, who had a right to it, and took it. And when Reguel saw the stick in the hand of Moses, he wondered at it, and he gave him his daughter Zipporah for a wife. Isn't that an interesting story? That sounds exactly like the sword in the stone story. Hold on, let me get, there we go. All right, yeah. so that's, that is the sword in the stone story, basically, right? We've got uh, Arthur, the pure one who is able to take the sword from the stone, etc., and become the king and stuff like that. The sword in the stone. Okay, first of all, the sword is the blue beam. All right, Sh -sh -sh shoots up out of Rupus Negra, the vol the uh, plasma volcano, and the stone is the the plasma volcano, all right. And it stays there for a while, and no one can remove it until somebody can, essentially, until it disappears, until it goes away. And then you have kingdoms and all this other stuff that gets set up afterwards. All right, so we talked about the Caduceus already. Uh, the the staff of Moses also was, uh, they, they put like a bronze serpent on the top of it. And whoever would look at that serpent, that, that symbol, that, that staff with the serpents on it and stuff like that, whoever would look at that would be healed from these fiery serpents that were sent to like torment the Hebrews. Interesting. Very interesting. All right, let's move on to something else. I'm going to do one last screen share here. I thought I ran across this article. Um, actually, various articles that are about this, right? Because I was looking at various uh, petroglyphs, cave paintings, and stuff like that. Where'd the chat go? There it is. Yeah, I was looking at these different cave paintings and petroglyphs and stuff. And then, okay, so let, let me back up. There Hey, in too deep. Welcome to the Good Vibe Trap. Now, there are various cave paintings from various Native Americans across America, North America, right? Um, everywhere in the world, actually. But the Kumash people of, like, the California region, you know, maybe northern Mexico, all the way up the coastline up there, uh, they have left their imprint with various cave paintings. Now, this is really interesting. Do you see this symbol up here that's being painted? Let me show you a better picture here. Booyah. So they took the picture over here. They've enhanced it over here so you can see what it is. You're looking as if you're in the cave, looking straight up. 
at the roof of the cave. And this is what these people drew. This was considered to be a sacred drawing, a drawing of importance. And the strange thing about these Kumash uh, cave paintings, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Where is the rest of them? They don't have any other ones. Anyways, these cave paintings are really enigmatic. They're real strange, as many of them are, right? Uh, and people can't really figure out what they are of. Now, if they come and if they put on the Rowdy Rowdy Piper glasses of the Plasma Apocalypse and then look at these pictures again, they'll be like, oh, I see. Okay. But they don't. So they have no idea what they are. They're just strange images. This one in particular. Now, here's the news story that broke all over the place. They basically are like, Eureka, we found it. We know why there's all these weird, crazy looking drawings that don't make any sense to us. And they base it off of this one right here, right? This, they say, looks just like this flower right here, which obviously they just smoked this flower and got super high and went into their cave and drew all kinds of weird drawings on their cave. Can you believe that? I'm not dismissing the fact that various people across time and cultures have uh, used various plants and stuff like that for different purposes, especially shaman and witch doctors and, I mean, regular doctors, everybody, okay? They, this is a practice that's been used by many people to help people to see into the spirit world or to help people to feel better, you know, all kinds of different applications, right? But what they're saying is we can't figure out what these drawings are, so obviously they were high. That's their, that's, that is their, literally their explanation. Let me give you an alternative, okay? These ancient peoples were survivors and the families of survivors of a, a worldwide apocalyptic catastrophe. They drew this symbol of the circle, right, with the spirals coming off of it, and then the spirals change direction once they get too far out and stuff, because that's what they saw, when they went out of the cave, okay? They they saw this. They knew it was important. Maybe they didn't even know what it was. I bet a lot of them didn't. But they certainly knew that it was important enough for them to record on the cave of their house, wherever they're staying, or their, you know, their house wall, their cave wall, or whatever. But isn't that hilarious that modern academics just goes, ah, looks kind of like that. They must have been high. That's all. They all just got high, went into the cave, and drew crazy pictures. Nothing important here. We can stop looking into it. It's, it's basically the vibe that I'm getting. I think that's crazy. Isn't that ridiculous? All right, let me let me stop uh, sharing here. Boom. Let's actually put this back up. This is kind of a cool thing to end it on. I like this, this little video that I found here. That's pretty sweet, right? All right, so... I also want to say a big shout out to everyone who's been uh, checking out my website, daydreamers.com. I've been getting a lot of people joining lately. <laughs> my phone's blowing up. So and so joined the website. So and so joined the website, um, which is sweet. But now I have now I'm gonna have to start working on the website a bit more. It, the website's cool, and I'll also give you guys a heads up. The uh, mobile version is unfinished, so while it is, it's also cool. Uh, some of the newer stuff needs to be kind of cleaned up, but the desktop version is amazing. If you ever want to check out my website, check out the desktop version. There's like a chat in there and stuff too, so you guys can try to keep in contact with one another if you don't want to just do it through the comments section, you know, here on my YouTube channel or other places or whatever. Uh, you can totally become a member and stuff and, you know, give your little details or share them or don't, and you guys can talk to each other on my website as well if you're interested in stuff like that. Um... Does anybody have any questions? The chat is open right now. I'm thinking about what I would like to do moving forward as, as my channel grows and stuff um, and more and more people are watching. I have to try to do things in different ways. So um, I, I haven't been doing the call-in segment. I'm not sure what to do with that. <laughs> I like engaging everyone, but when there's so many people to engage, it, I have to figure out a way to make it fair for everybody. But uh, for right now, what do you guys think? Do you guys have a good time? I did. We talked about the North Pole. We talked about Rupus Negra. We talked about the Plasma Volcano and the, the, the sign in the sky for all to see, the light in the sky. 
the various lights in the sky. We talked about John D. Mercator. We talked about the old maps that were made, even a globe that features this land on the North Pole itself. I'm not going to get into all the various reasons as to why that's missing from the modern things, but if you pull up Google and you do the same little thing with Google, it's just going to show you water, blurry water at that, okay? It's going to show you nothing, essentially. They're basically saying there's not even ice up there. It's just, it's just blurry blue. That's all that you get. Far Eye Music, welcome. It's good to see you. Well, hey, I, I'm, I want to say thanks for joining me, everyone. I super appreciate that you guys are finding so much value in the videos I've been sharing. I hope you can stick around and come check out my channel more next time. Um, I think I'm going to wrap things up. So let's, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jam some sweet music right now and play the credits. I love you guys. Until next time, I'm Jay Dreamer saying good vibes and goodbye. I'm trying so hard to fade away. Oh, me.